words of 1964 in uh, describing the word ecclesia. He says it was a convened assembly of all the citizens of a city who had not lost their civic rights. Apart from the fact that its decisions conformed to the laws of the state, the ecclesia directed the policy of the city, it declared wars, made peace, contracted treaties, arranged alliances, it elected generals, other military officers, it assigned troops to different campaigns and dispatched them, dispatched them from the city. It was ultimately responsible for the conduct of all military operations and a few other things. What does that mean? It means this, that when Jesus stood that day and said, I will build my ecclesia, everybody knew what he meant because Jerusalem had an ecclesia. And it was the governing ruling power of the city. When Jesus said, I will build mine, and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. People had a reference point for what that meant. It wasn't a group of people on the street corner singing Kumbaya. It was a government of God established on earth to make known the moral values and strategies of the king of the kingdom. Number five. If we're going to go into other nations, we need to occupy through servanthood before establishing church. When we go into nations, particularly through Africa and other places, we go on in with a fivefold, um, well, m more than just a fivefold, but we go in with farming God's way, which we found very effective. We teach the most rural farmers how to build uh, by farming God's way, even a, a successful crop we build it in front of a, the leader of a small church's house so it can feed the village and then feed neighboring villages. Micro MBA, family issues, health, you go in to serve. You go in with a spirit of servanthood, not again to put up our flag and say, come and join us. I was standing with a spiritual son overlooking a slum area of, of um, Honduras uh, not all that long ago. And as we stood on a hill looking over at one of the cities there and one of the slum areas, he asked me, he said, what would we do if we came here knowing what we now know about the kingdom? How would we really start? I won't go into all that we discussed, but one thing we knew, we wouldn't rent a building, get a band and a pulpit. There'd be something far more at stake than that. Number six, understand the difference between mentoring and fathering. It's very important. You can mentor anybody, you can't father everybody. It's a very important issue, something we've got to discuss and maybe talk through in greater ways, but you've got to understand the difference between mentoring and fathering. In fathering, uh, I'll just say this much on that point, in fathering it's like eldering or shepherding, the key is not to meet every need, it's to see that every need is met. In mentoring you're specifically working with a person through an area of their life, but a good father will release sons to other people for mentoring in certain areas of their life. It's a whole thing we need to look at. Point number seven, raise sons, send sons. Children are born, sons are given. In Isaiah chapter nine, uh, talking about Jesus, he said, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. It was 30 years between a, son being a child being born and Jesus being given as a son. And that 30 years will transform your leadership training and your raising of sons. It's one of my favorite subjects to teach on that 30 year period of Jesus' life. It's an incredible thing. No, you've got to know, this is the same point, know who are called to you and who are called through you. If, you don't, if you're not able to identify those things, you'll end up with unfulfilled expectations in relationships You'll end up with people getting disillusioned. As someone said, you can only get disillusioned if you had an illusion in the first place. So it's very important to sort out the illusions and get rid of them so we can walk in reality. Expectations, what, what can you really journey of in these areas? Around the world for us now, most of our nation's planting that's going on is being done by the 18 to 30 year old range group. Now, um, it's important. When we look at across a meeting like this, what's lacking is the young apostles. And we've got to believe for a generational shift um, right now. It's very important. And you can only do that by raising sons. Um, without extending on that too much, um, I just want to say in point eight, which is really like a conclusion, if we've been on this apostolic journey for more than 10 to 15 years and do not have sons to send, we have big questions to ask of ourselves. Someone once asked, what is the, 
how do you tell a false apostle? Well, I guess really is when the house is built, is he on the roof or in the foundations? Because at the end of the day, if we're seeding something to change nations, we are not going to be the steeple. And that's going to be costly. Very costly. It all starts with, here I am, Lord, send me. For Jesus, it progressed to, here I am, Father, send them. And one of the great places you can get to as a spiritual father is where that is your position. Here I am, Lord, send them. That's where Paul got to. I'll send you, Timothy. If you get him, you get me. For Jesus, it progressed to that point. So you see, Jesus started through that life when he became a son at 30 years old when he heard the father say, this is my beloved son. To move from there to being a spiritual father, that's a scripture that changed my life forever when I saw that, that Isaiah saw prophetically Jesus remembered as an everlasting father, not as an everlasting son. And that he went from being a child to being a son to being a father. In John 17, when he prayed this, he said, Father, glorify me now with yourself as I was before all this began because I've completed the work that you've given me to do. It was amazing that Jesus said that to the Father before he went to the cross. 